Hello YouTube, this is Morgan Airspeed Prime here with my next Legend of Korra Book 2 Spirits episode commentary. This is going to be the commentary for K213 Darkness Falls, second to last episode of Book 2 Spirits. This episode commentary is going to begin with the opening for Darkness Falls, so get your episode that you have ready to go, including that Avatar Fire, Earth, Air, Water um, intro. I'm going to stop speaking now in a moment, and then when I start speaking again, then you'll be synced up with my audio commentary track. So I'm going to stop speaking now. Okay, so here we are with uh, Darkness Falls. <laughs> As I said before, second to last episode of this book, and obviously the first part of the two-part finale as well. This is the episode where a lot of bad stuff happens, and then the hope happens in obviously the last episode, but yeah, some really big moments happen in this one. This The last episode is often considered better just because there's the more positive moments. You have the huge character moments for Korra. But there's some really um, so strong moments, even if maybe they're not the happiest moments in this uh, book. And uh, a surprising amount of character stuff with Tenzin, I think, is uh, one of the big uh, things in this episode. And in the finale that I didn't quite expect. And I, I was glad that he got an arc. But I didn't expect him to have that big of a role in the finale in terms of uh, having so much character stuff going on. I did expect a huge focus on Korra. As I said in the last commentary, interesting, Vatu refers to Korra as Rava only. Doesn't have any care in the world for who she is as a human, only that, only the spirit inside. And instantly goes into the Avatar state to, to, to stop... Uh, Vatu merging with uh, Unalak, and I love that airbending move from Korra there, it's probably the, one of the, obviously her move from the last episode, taking out the spirits was amazing, but that was just a really impressive one too, just in terms of like, utilizing the kind of suction abilities of airbending, um, to kind of <laughs> get Unalak out of the way, because the key in this battle right now for her is to just stop the merging of uh, Una, Unalak and Vatu. Wow, those two names are really difficult to say, like, one after the other like that. Hence why Unavatu is such a nice, uh, nicely made name. But yeah, obviously they're looking for Genora in here, um, and that's key. And I like that this is a kind of continuous thing throughout Book 2 Spirits, that it is the Katang siblings um, and their little arguments that they have, but ultimately, you know, you see their development in terms of, you know, they, they had some issues in their relationship um, at the start, but they do develop past them over the course of this book, and there's some really good stuff in this episode with them, their character arcs, especially Tenzin gets some big moments in the fog of lost souls. And uh, I like Tenzin knows instantly that they have to look for uh, some form of spirit guide. That's what Aang dealt with, with uh, Roku being there, Heibai and stuff like that. And obviously he's looking, he finds the nearest spirit and hopes that this is going to help him out. And it, th this is the great Alyle voice character for book two. We expected it to be something huge, like she was going to be the villain, but she's just this random dark spider spirit here, voiced by great Alyle. Um, and I find that hilarious. And there's also, I think, a mushroom that she voices uh, coming up soon as well. A nice reference there to kind of foamy mouth guy with Kaya foaming at the mouth there. That's just a thing they like to do when characters kind of get knocked out, show that they're kind of foaming at the mouth. That's pretty cool. But yep, completely lost. No idea where Janora is. And then we cut straight back from relative kind of uh, ease. You know, there's some drama towards, you know, finding Janora. But from that to fight for the fate of the world, it's... um. A little bit jarring, but I think it works in that you have two very different stories going on with characters that kind of mean different things. And we see that the power of um, an avatar and a spirit combined, a human and a spirit combined, the avatar, is still powerful enough to take on Vatu even now, 10,000 years on. Vatu still doesn't know how to really combat uh, this kind of merging of uh, two different beings. And uh, that's key in that he he understands, like, okay, 
I'm willing to kind of merge with a human to be more powerful, but I don't care about the human at all, which is the exact opposite of the actual good avatar, where Rava and Wong both cared for each other, and then Rava cares for the humans as well, because of Wan. Um And as I said in the last episode as well, um, Mako and Bo Lin are given like a really tough task in this episode to kind of fend off Unalong from getting into the spirit world. Um, and really putting them at risk, but they needed to do it for Korra. And you see the way they're talking, you know, like, we just have to stop him, even if we get hurt, it's that important, the fate of the world on the line. Um, they just get some really nice moments, you know, to, to really show that they are part of Team Avatar, they get their kind of to-be heroes and stuff like that. Here's the other Great Alisle voiced character, this spirit mushroom, talking. And, you know, it's a friendly mushroom, reference to Sokka and the uh, cactus juice. Mushroom, maybe it's friendly. And then Boomy's reaction, was that you? <laughs> no, and here Iroh returns once again in the series. And again, he has this habit of just surprising us this season. I really like that. Comes back. He's been there 40 years. Gives us a bit of a timeline on things. And they know who he is because, obviously, he he hasn't aged since uh, basically the end of Avatar Last Airbender time. So they recognize who who's who. Just nice to know that they they know they know, know him. And everyone knows what's going on in the spirit world, how important things are. And Tenzin just says, you know, finding Janor is really important. I need to do this. Only the lost will ever find you. And he, he doesn't quite give that as proper advice to um, Tenzin, but Tenzin ultimately realizes that it does. That's the exact advice that they need. Because Jinora is lost, they'll probably find Jinora in that spot, and they have to get themselves lost. So they get themselves captured by spirit. It's weird, but it makes sense. It's, it's really nicely done. Again, what an intense fight scene, just the, the great music and. Uh, great animation just on them. some really powerful bending moves. Finally really getting to see the powerful bending this uh, in Korra. Completely knocking Vatu out with those earth bending moves. And then the key thing here is that Korra's trying to do it exactly what Wan did uh, 10,000 years ago. She's not really doing anything new herself and it's about to work. But Unalak is the kind of key f f factor now, ten kind of ten thousand years on, in that he stops the Avatar from repeating things again. And when this fails, Korra really has no kind of backup plan because she only thinks about okay, what Wan did, what the Avatar needs to do, and that's something that she really kind of has to develop through over the course of the um, this, the end of this episode and the next episode, just um learning that she's powerful herself, not just as the Avatar, and can make this decisions, choices herself, and really kind of forge her own path as the Avatar, instead of just doing the exact same thing as every other Avatar. But Eska and Desna arrive, They're, they've been doubting their father a bit, they still are, but are still on his side. Um, and again, like a lot of stuff is continuing on from earlier points in the season, the Eska Desna thing also continues, and I I quite enjoy how, how it's done over the course of these episodes and that they interact with um, Mako and Bolin. And through the the Boesca relationship, we kind of get them turning around, which I really like. And here we have the Fog of Lost Souls. And it is a spirit prison, basically. And the reveal later on is that the... The fog itself is just a giant spirit, and it just affects people's minds and makes them lose hope, lose a uh, complete sense of themselves, uh, as is going to happen, and we see with some other characters. But here, the ce sealing process is about to happen again until Unalak arrives once more. And Vatu is free once again, Korra's down. And this is the key factor here. Vatu has a human fighting for him, and he doesn't realize the importance of that, apart from just power yet. And he doesn't realize that even towards the end, so that's cool. Um, little trick here from the brothers is just a nice thing with their characters. You know, they have do the. We see, you know from like Republic City Hustle, they do these tricks together, so faking being unconscious and then just tricking them is just a nice thing to show. And 
everyone then piles into the spirit world as the big emerging happens basically so it's it's they do a good job of keeping the characters where they need to be so the characters get to see these important things in this case Eska and Desna see their father become a monster more or less and see that he doesn't care about them and being their father anymore kind of sort of thing and here it is Dark Avatar, Unavatu, not quite Unavatu yet, that happens at the end, but basically Unalak, the Dark Avatar here. And I love the red eyes just to show that this is a Dark Avatar evil. The red eyes for the Dark Avatar because that's part of uh, Vatu's color pattern, and then the kind of white blue light for um, Korra, and obviously sealing it with um, the power of harmonic convergence like Wan did all those years ago. Just retroactively kind of revealing more and more about this process through just doing it again, same time scale. And then, you know, we are we are now one, we are, we are bonded forever is what Juan said, so th there's some nice similarities there. And then we have the Battle of the Avatars, you know, their era talks, it's these two kind of ancient beings, even though obviously um, Udovatu is new, Ancient beings, Clash of the Titans sort of thing. Not quite yet, though. Clash of the Titans happens in the next episode. Imprisoning you in your own darkest memories. That's what it's all about. And then out of nowhere we get Zhao. He wasn't killed... He was brought into the spirit world, or it's either he was killed in the physical world, but his spirit was brought into the um, uh, spirit world to basically last forever in torture for killing the moon spirit in Avatar The Last Airbender. And he still goes through all the stuff. He's just consumed with capturing the Avatar um, and being the conqueror, yeah, the moon slayer, and all these other titles he gives himself. And that's how Zhao was consumed. And you just see that it's it's the thing the character was obsessed with is going to just consume them even more so in the fog of lost souls, and we're going to see that with our characters here, our four, our three uh, siblings here, once the fog begins to affect them. And then the I like the way the fight does kind of go in and out of the spirit world. It it makes for a really dynamic fight that it doesn't just all happen in the spirit world. They go in out. Characters are coming in and out all the time as well. There's some really amazing stuff happening. Like look at this water bending battle. They're not really using other elements, but um, obviously the newly formed dark avatar is getting the advantage. Core is a bit beaten up already going into the battle. Remember the. Remember that uh, Ugi crashed and she was on Ugi, so she was probably still injured from there. And then really brutal here, you know, Unalak is about to crush his niece to death in an ice chasm, basically. And we get an epic moment here, really epic, Avatar The Last Airbender epic-esque moment here. Korra kind of beginning to lose hope, but Rava has learned from Wan to not lose hope. This fight isn't over yet. And just that voice for, by April Stewart for Rava is amazing. Just a confidence, do not give in. The music kind of picks up. <laughs> Avatar State comes on. Boom. <laughs> and it's just amazing. You can just forget that Dark Avatar only has water bending. Actual Avatar has all four elements. And the, oh, what a line there. You cannot win. It's just boom. <laughs> Reinvigorated Avatar State ba battle be re begins again. Just really strong moment in the series. That classic Avatar State moment with the Avatar State music. Really well done. And this is an interesting one here. Just the fact that Boomy's afraid of cannibals. Is it since it, the, this the setup for it? At least with Tenzin, Kaya, and Zhao, is what their biggest kind of fear is is amplified here. So. Is Boomy petrified of cannibals? Was he on some mission where this happened? He saw this happen or something like that? There's some interesting stuff. And then with Kaya, we see this thing that's been presented in that fact that 
she was away from her mother and family basically for so many years because she wanted to find herself and only returned to her mother when their father died. So she's kind of her biggest fear, you know, was the or failure, I suppose, was the fact that she separated herself from her family for so long and maybe doesn't have one herself. No, no one can tie her down. I think is what she just said. And this leaves Tenzin alone. And it's an interesting decision because I think Tenzin deserves the moment to himself with his father that he's going to get. And then Mako pointing out the fact he's trying to bring an eternal darkness. He's going to destroy the world. He doesn't care about you. And <laughs> Tenzin just realizes that that's completely true. He doesn't. He hasn't shown any reason for caring about us at all. And Eska is the one who kind of defends her father. And then... You think Bolin is acting here because he's been presented as an actor the whole season, and people like him as an actor. But then you just see throughout the episode that, like, wait, he actually cares for her a lot. And it comes out of nowhere, it's almost kind of silly in how it comes out of nowhere so much, but it works oddly because he did like her initially and stayed with her for a while. And it was just her kind of overbearing personality that kind of took the two apart. But he does actually like her. And I, that's a, just an interesting decision to have a kind of random relationship that just comes in at the end. And for it to basically be better than Mako, Korra and Asami, that love triangle for the whole season is is one that shows you how kind of they're not doing the Mako, Korra the Sammy thing the best, but shows that this show can do romance really well. And this is this the the Eska Bolin kiss was uh interesting that they're they're considering, you know, like lo loving each other and the look back there from uh Mako to uh Desna was amazing. And then there's the reveal that was acting. Yeah, and he just wasn't like that at all. And <laughs> It doesn't just like they will certainly perish as they walk in there, and they're willing to let them save Korra from their father. And you know, the the aim here is that Korra wants to save Unalak from basically killing himself. She doesn't want to kill her uncle. Ultimately, she's kind of first forced to do that. But that's the kind of drama of this book. It was all about family ties in many ways. That this whole book, and for it to end with Korra having to take out her uncle, who ultimately taught her to be spiritual, but lost himself in being overly spiritual in a way. And it's just a really impressive thing over the course of the book in that it is all about family ties, whether that be Tenzin and his siblings, Korra and her parents, uh, Mako and Bo Bolin, Eska Desna, Unalak Tonrock. There's just so many of these family connections. Ultimately, it comes down to the battle between, you know, Korra and her uncle, Unalak and his niece. Um, and then here we see the thing. This is probably the thing that no. It probably came out of. How to word this? I don't think that there was a surprise that um, after this happened that Rava was killed. But the, the surprise was just the fact that Rava was ripped out of Korra. Not necessarily that after this she was killed, but really just dramatic moment. Just seeing. Um, Basically, Korra's not the Avatar anymore. She still can bend all four elements because that's part of the reincarnation cycle of the Avatar and not something just specific to Rava that she holds the other three elements that the Avatar is born with. All Avatars from now on are reincarnations of Wan, who was a quadruple bender, basically. So Korra can bend all four elements even without Rava. That's who she is as a bender. And then this is the Tenzin thing here with the character development. It's been this thing over the course of the whole book that he's kind of been distracted a bit with oh, through the kind of uh, um, dealing with his uh, kids and then dealing with Korra, but they haven't so much dealt with the fact that Tenzin thinks that he has to be his father almost. We can see older Avatar Aang here, great. And he thinks he's failed, but the thing is he's failed at being Aang because he's not Aang. He's Tenzin. He's done his best, and that's all he can do. And then Aang points that out here. 
I'm really wise here, false perception of yourself. You are not me, you are Tenzin. And that's the thing that Tenzin learns from his father, he then teaches this to Korra, and that's ultimately how he becomes her teacher in teaching her this crucial thing about herself, and that's um, probably the best thing about the finale in terms of character moments and that, just the, this, them learning this to be yourself, don't try and be someone else. Korra is not Wan, Korra is also not Rava, Korra is Korra. Tenzin is not Aang, he's himself, he shouldn't try to be the Avatar, he shouldn't try to be the last airbender. Even though he kind of is, he can't do the same things that Aang can do. And then he's the one to kind of save the day here through learning this and gets Jinora back. And it's just a really nice moment, but again, the contrast between the different stories, they're going to cut from this to Korra defenseless against everyone. The first light spirit right there on Jinora's shoulder that we've seen basically in so many episodes because of how powerful Vasu has been. And that's key. Jinora as the guide, what makes her so special is that she apparently attracts light to, to her. Any little amount of light that's left is attracted to her. And while it's not explained it is shown to us that she attracts light to her and she's the only one who has light spirits around her so it makes sense that she's the one to basically um, draw out the light within Unavatu once he destroys Rava so there's some setup to it but we see everything's going wrong here um, Mako Bolin taken out Korra helpless and then just Rava getting completely destroyed here. This is just a tragic moment and really emotional. With the way it's shot, you know, you see each of the avatars get destroyed. Basically the memory, the knowledge of that avatar gone at each hit that Rava takes. And Korra feels every one of them because she is part of this cycle. And so she feels every single one of these. It's such an emotional moment. I just It can't be underestimated how like big of a moment in this universe is to do this to the title being of of this series, the Avatar, to basically just take out every ten thousand years of being the Avatar, destroy the spirit that makes the Avatar the Avatar, and just what a crazy way to end the episode with the death of Rava and because Rava is now nothing but tiny light particle, Rava uh, uno, Vatu is the most powerful he will ever be. But again, even, even despite that, the spirit of light being gone, Janora still has light around her, with the light spirits there. And that's what makes her special. Um, definitely could have done with being explained a little bit more, but I think it really works now, looking back at this. She is the only character to have light spirits around her. And this is where we see, basically, what I probably consider to be the death of Unalak as a character, basically. The kids walk in, they see their father become this giant, monstrous being that Tonrock, Korra, everyone said he would become if he was allowed to go through with this. And again, he has the chance right here to end Korra, end any chance of a fight back, but he ignores her because right now, She's just a human, and he only sees he sees that he's got Rava out of the way, out of the picture. His fight is over. He can just take over the world now, and so leaves Korra alive. And it makes complete sense. It's not like a stupid villain thing to do, because we saw that Vatu didn't care about humans. We saw that Unalak didn't care about humans. So Unavatu, the combination of the two, doesn't care about humans either. And then it's a brilliant thing going into the finale that... Ultimately, what defeats him is just a human. And I think that's brilliant. It's just Korra on her own without the Avatar spirit, without the help of the other Avatars. It's just Korra, Korra with some advice from her proper mentor, Tenzin, which is what this whole series basically started with, her leaving Tenzin, going to Unalak, and ultimately it's her getting some of the best advice probably she's ever got from Tenzin, who got it from Aang in this episode, that saves the day, and that's really well written, in my opinion. So, that's the second last episode commentary for book two. Um, 
no commentary tomorrow, Wednesday, because I'll probably be putting up my review of the Search hardcover if I can get my ha hands on that book tomorrow. Um, but I definitely will have the last commentary up on Thursday. At the latest, I'll have it up on Thursday. So uh, I've definitely enjoyed doing this. This journey has been great. Really pointed out some stuff that... I've kind of learned about the episodes. I don't do really any preparation before these commentaries. I just sit down, turn on the episode, open up the recorder, hit play, and talk about what I see. I don't watch them ahead of time. So that's why I'm often sometimes just get, just get obsessed with watching the scenes themselves. But yep, that's been my commentary. Thanks for listening, and bye.